Hey everybody, it's Cheryl Lawson. Welcome to our weekly Google Plus Hangout at Live FAQ, sponsored by our friends at Step One Health. Uh, today, I'm so excited. We have a special guest with us today, Miss Tamra Hall. Welcome, Tamra. Hi, guys. <laughs> and of course, with us, as always, Greg Hill. So, Greg, um, I know we've had a few of these Hangouts, uh, but a few people might not have been introduced to you. So, why don't you introduce yourself and and kind of uh, our topic today, just so that everyone knows, is detox, right? And understanding uh, what that is. There's a lot of buzz on the internet and around the television shows about detoxing, and so we wanted to kind of uh, you know, uh, unveil that topic and understand how detoxing uh, benefits your health. So please introduce yourself, Greg, and and let us know uh, your passion for this topic. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks again, Cheryl. It's good to be with you again. I know we're usually doing it on Fridays, but uh, it's nice to kind of hop in uh, sort of midweek. And so to reintroduce myself, um, I'm Greg Hill. I uh, handle the um, sort of the clinical staffing for Step One Health, and I'm a practicing physician assistant uh, today, not in the traditional sense. I'm actually uh, not in uh, in a clinic, but I look at labs and diagnostics daily um, and do a lot of work around that and work with um, work with consumers and patients in that way. Um, and I'm very, very excited about uh, being able to chat with Tamara today on the subject of detoxification, largely because I am so in tune with toxicities around me and around our world and I kind of get excited about identifying them and trying to educate and uh, clarify some of the things that you know, a lot of people may not know so I think it's going to be a nice uh, chat so thanks for having me on again Cheryl. Cool. And so Tamara would you like to just tell us a little bit about you and and uh, how you're passionate about this topic of detox? Yeah, well, I guess my journey started back when, um, you know, a former high-level executive and family started having issues, and I realized at the time I couldn't work and take care of the family, so I, I used both my clinical background and business background to jump in to be what I call CEO of my family's health, which turned into be almost a practice now of 63, I think, is the group that I'm trying to help, and... Uh, so I'm learning a lot in the same rigor that I had at my business. I'm applying to courses and classes to learn as much as I can about, you know, my body and my family's body. And so detoxing is probably one of the things that I found the most fascinating and easiest to do and probably had the most profound effect on pretty much everybody so far. Wonderful. So um, let's just jump into this conversation, Greg. I know you talked about um, you know the environment, but what is the background of detox? Yeah, well, de it's it's a great question because detox. You know, we've heard about detox and detox programs actually for many, many years, and more recently, just within the last you know five years, we hear a, a lot more about it. Mainly because there are so many different communities looking at um, trying to understand major metabolic health issues, and these communities end up being around you know fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and then of course we've got diabetes and others that are a little deeper in the weeds, looking at you know methylation and things like that. But the tone here is that. People have, you know, a, a metabolic issue and a problem that doesn't allow their, you know, their body to do what it's made to, to do. And so we get, um, you know, so hence getting into detoxification. Well, why is it toxic? Why do we have, you know, all of these elements that are, uh, you know, beating us up and inflaming us and all that? And it really starts right from the very minute that uh, that the seed gets fertilized. And so, if you take a look at twins, you know, way back, you know, monozygotic twins in the same womb. Well, the the second that that uh, cell starts to grow, it's it's uh, subject to the environment. That environment being the womb, and then as we get you know out into the world, the environment continues, and that includes everything from how hot and cold, and you know how the air quality is, what we're eating. You know, that's one of my common tones, um, Cheryl is. You know, are we eating the right things? What's um, what's sustaining? Uh, what's toxic? You know, what are the um, harmful and helpful biologic and chemical agents? You know, all of that sort of plays a part here. And so, it, I used to look at detoxification, and it kind of went, well, I don't know about that. I mean, our bodies do a pretty, and I've I've, I've said this many times to my patients. I say, hey, the body's fantastic at repairing itself, and truly it is. But at the same time, you know. Um, 
it, it can only do it to a certain degree, and you know we are uh, hit and inundated by toxins. You know, some of us more frequently than others, and some people less frequently. But it's to varying degrees, and once this occurs, you know, all of these toxins accumulate, and they accumulate in um, in our fatty tissues in our body, and they accumulate in joints. And sort of the effects, the downstream effects of that is is really very very harmful. I mean, the the um, very fact that we can't, you know, get good sleep, we can't uh, process our, our nutrition properly. We have, uh, you know, chronic metabolic conditions like diabetes, or we have GERD, uh, the inability to eat food and not, you know, have uh, sort of this heartburn and uh, the need to belch. And so it's very timely, and uh, and so I, I appreciate you asking me because I think, you know, if anyone just kind of looks around the room, you can say, gosh, what are the toxins in my world? And they are just numerous and they're everywhere. And so, you know, it really does kind of take a talk like this so we can start getting, you know, not necessarily dispelling myths, but bringing to the surface, you know, exactly what they are and where you're going to run into them. And then, you know, where do we go? What's the next thing we do? And how do we approach, you know, the, the subject of detoxification? So, um, you know, you mentioned, I think, you know, look around the room and, and the environment a, a couple of times. So what are some of the harmful effects that, you know, we're surrounded with every day? Well, you know, in the thing I've uh, talked about, um, methylation, of course, is one of just one of those substances. It's one of those processes that goes on in the body, you know, billions of times every second, and it's just constantly in play. And what will happen is we'll have the equation of certain toxins that will make those metabolic pathways sort of short circuit and stop and not allow it to kind of go on and do what it's supposed to do. And so you take any one of these chronic conditions that we've talked about from obesity to diabetes to high blood pressure to, you know, I mean, we just name it. And we, uh, you know, I always talk about running back upstream. We look at the functional capacity of, you know, whatever the organ system is that produces these symptoms. And when we get back in there, we just say, gosh, if we've got toxins that are making that organ and that organ system not run efficiently, the effect of that are the symptoms that we feel, and, and you know, symptoms are widespread, and we know them all from headaches to, to you know, weight gain to just feeling malaise and fatigue, and you know, all of those different things. And so, um, to to pinpoint, it, it's really very easy for me to say, gosh, well, what is it? What are the symptoms that you feel? And you can say, well, gosh, what has you know, what caused that effect? It's going to be a combination of the environment, the toxicities in your environment, you know, what you're feeding, how you're sustaining yourself, and then of course our genetics plays a part as well. And that's where, you know, people's sensitivities are they overly sensitive? Do they just have, you know, some mild sensitivity? Um, you know, we're going to kind of play in, you know, different extremes when we look at the true code of somebody and what their what their genetics are. Um, but you know how we react to it and how we protect ourselves is what's really important here. And and learning about detoxification. And I'll be honest with you, this is a um, it's a it's not necessarily a new subject to me, but it's one that's got so many different arms and moving parts that I had time you know putting my finger on the pulse and saying, okay, here's detox, here's the appropriate regimen, and here's the first. And so th I think this is going to be a nice. Talk about the ups, the downs. You know, what are some of the processes and things like that. The, so, Tamara, that leads to to the next question: Is you know, how do you approach uh, detoxification? Well, and and I'll say that I tend to simplify things because I usually, with my male family friends, have about five minutes to explain really complex problems <laughs> in a way that you can understand. So, uh, bear with the simplicity. But just as Greg was describing, I try and give people the visual of it's not just your toxins, but it's actually the byproducts of all the things that bring along the good stuff that your body needs. So when you think about making a cake, right, you have your box of uh, cake mix, you have your eggs, you have your butter in its package or oil, and you have your milk in its carton, and after you put the contents that are actually going to make the cake or that you're going to use, you have all this trash laying around afterward. So when you think about detox, think about not just what the body uses and the minerals and the things and the nutrients that it takes from the substance, but all the leftovers. And so now visualize that counter. If you never put all that leftover container and garbage in a trash can and take it out to the street, 
you end up with a hoarder's mess. And that's one of the visuals you can actually think about inside your body. And I, I can honestly say I've never thought of it that way. And yet, for years, have fought the cellulite, you know, saga of the thighs. And now, in my mind, through my biochemistry learning, it's like I see these little cellulite bags, my hefty bags that are full of all these toxins and things because guess what? The the box of mix that I bought is more box and cardboard and trash than nutrients that I'm getting out. And so now it's something as simple as every time I eat an orange and I think about the fiber in the orange, the vitamin C that I need or the minerals I need, I know there's a byproduct to everything. Add to that our environment becoming just more complex and me being a frequent traveler, I can tell you now when I sit on that tarmac and breathe in the diesel exhaust from the planes ahead of me, I don't know if it's psychological or not, but I get off that plane feeling like, oh my God, I need to go detox. <laughs> so, and yeah. I've actually asked people, what can I do in those instances? And something as simple as taking extra vitamin C or glycine will help the body do its process. And, and so I can't tell you, I probably apply the detox theory daily, whether it's in my situation of what I'm consuming or if I see somebody, you know, if a family member, and this happened recently with my husband, he shows all of a sudden he's starting to develop this rash on his skin. Well, in my mind now, I see, okay, that's a detoxing issue. He's backing up with things in his body that his body needs to get rid of, and now the way his body's doing that is through the skin, literally creating rashes or inflammation and histamine release in his skin tissue. So um, pretty much every condition is some form of your body wanting to get rid of something it doesn't like, and it needs those things that help it, vitamin C, minerals, nutrients, to help it either expel and or do the process as necessary to put all that trash in the bag. And I think you guys have talked about glucathione and methylate, methylation. In my mind, when I hear glucathione, I hear hefty. <laughs> it's my hefty garbage bag that I put all my, attach all my crap to to take out to the curb. Now, yeah. the fish man still has to come and take it away, but at least it's helping me rid my counter and my household in the trash. That's a, it, that's a great analogy, Tamara, and I appreciate you putting it that way because it's so true. You know, I, I always think about that accumulation in, in you know, in the fat, first off, mostly in fat cells because that's where the metabolites kind of like to store. Um, and when we think about our environment being largely food derived and if we're feeding ourselves poison, we can kind of see it sort of collecting in the midriff, you know, and then, yeah. um, then Besides that, I, I kind of do the same thing as you, Tamara. I look at my world in an, an environmental way now, where I have um, peace and solace, and you know the things that are pro-inflammatory. And you know, I know you've looked at these, you know, over the last several weeks, Tamara. Every week, you know, we talk about the inflammation, and so again, the inflammation is secondary to the toxins, and they're, you know, they all kind of have that accumulation. And it's funny, Cheryl, when we look back at our last, you know, four to five weeks, really the, the conversation all goes around this continuum of, you know, the metabolic cycles, what's going on in our environment and how we're feeding and sustaining ourselves, what's toxic, how do we detox, you know, all of those are sort of a central that, um, I guess what I'd call the functional medicine. I'm not really great we're having discussed it. I think, Greg, I think Greg, you got frozen there for a second, but I think I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm I'm back. You know, my uh, my story was the same as it's always been, which is, hey, you know, how do we identify and understand metabolism and and uh, sequestering uh, or you know getting rid of the toxins and giving ourselves the sustenance to you know to do all the things that we've talked about over the last four weeks, you know, methylate and get rid of our inflammatory processes and eat the right things, you know, all of those things play a part, but, you know, as we get to the end stage, those toxicities accumulate and that's why, you know, we end up having the symptoms and, and you know, why this is a great topic and now we get to actually say, well, what do we do next? How can we approach this? Right. Well, so that's great. That's a great question because as Tamara brought up, you know, her husband 
is experiencing this, you know, the skin rash. So, uh, where do you start? What is the starting point for uh, for detox? Well, here, here's what's great. Tamara has done some great work in the the background science, and so I'm going to uh, hopefully be able to rely on her. Um, uh, sort of being deeper in this than me, but we started from a global perspective just saying, okay, we got to educate first. And education, you know, this is part of the education, what we're doing right now. What is it? What's it about? Where do you see it? Who, who's involved? You know, all of the things that are involved with toxicities and uh, the regimens to detoxify, um, you know, it really requires an education to the public because in in the, I wouldn't say in the wrong hands, I guess in hands that haven't really thought it through, you know, there are some downsides and some um, effects of, of uh, detoxing that people should be aware of. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we're identifying, you know, the process, the side effects, you know, how long it might take, what the, what the consumer, the patient may expect as well. Um, but, you know, all of that in addition to saying, well, how do we sustain, you know, what are the things that we need to feed ourselves, what are the things that we need to eliminate out of either our diet or out of our body and how that's done, you know, that's kind of the, the, the start and, and looking at what all the elements are, you know, from gut, you know, addressing the gut to the mind um, and then, you know, looking at, you know, all of the other things that influence that. That kind of sound about the size of it, Tamara? Yeah, and I oftentimes are, I to, again, simplify it, I tend to break it out into two kind of categories. Natural, what your body does naturally to get rid of its byproducts and toxins, and then facilitated, which is meaning either mechanically or through substances like you know, herbs or medications, and that's what you hear about most. But one of the things that I think is really lost in the, the whole ramification is that, you, like you said earlier, your body's a pretty good machine. And we do some pretty simple things and, you know, I have this theory that I call my PSP theory, which is pee, sweat, and poo are the best ways for the body to naturally get rid of things. And to your point, if somebody starts freeing up or releasing these toxins too rapidly, you're actually taxing your body more than if it's kept tucked away in the fat cell or tucked away somewhere um, because your body's either going to reabsorb it if you don't eliminate it. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's the piece that people sometimes miss or get confused about. They think detox, let me get it out of my body, but then guess what? If you're releasing all this into your bloodstream and you yeah. test it, then there's nothing there to absorb it. Your body's just going to reabsorb it. It's going to be in a vicious cycle. Yeah, for that point, uh, Tara is actually just reading today. One of the be one of the best examples of that is um, is Tylenol overdose. And so, just looking at you know what happens intracellular, and you know the essentially the way that's broken down and the cytochrome P450. Apologize yeah. for getting a little. But story short, um, that's what exactly happens with uh, you know with with the Tylenol overdoses. You know when it starts to metabolize and eliminate that toxin, it builds up within the cell and it can't. You know two, there are two cycles that go on in the cell, and the first one leading. I'm sure I shouldn't say that. The second one's leading the first, and long story short, accumulation of some very very bad and harmful things that in that case will cause you know a, a kidney disease or fa failure. Yeah, and that can be, you know, just in a good example to piggyback on that, it could be something as simple as your electrolyte imbalance so that your kidney filtration isn't working at its best and your liver filtration isn't working at its best. So anybody who's taking medications, if they're underhydrated or if their electrolytes are out, you're actually going to affect the whole chemical chemistry of how these drugs and things work in the body. And I know... Uh, that as we as a society diminish our basic minerals and supplies in our earth and in our food, it is not unlike, for, it is not unusual for people to be deficient in something as simple as potassium or magnesium is a big one for a lot of people. Zinc is another one. And, you know, these are all very simple things that you can do to help your own body kind of facilitate the process. And to Greg's point, add to that taking medication, you, you're just putting a whole bunch more trash on that counter and there's no bag there to, to collect it. So guess what? You're going to have problems. 
So we talked about, you know, th through the past few weeks, and of course we always talk about at Step 1 Health, you get a million numbers and that, you know, each person has a specific um, roadmap, if you will. We've talked genetics, we've talked, to, uh, you know, the regular lab numbers or chemistries. Now, so when we talk natural detox, you mentioned the pea sweat poop, which I love because that's now my favorite hashtag. By the way, <laughs> PSP. <laughs> PSP. <laughs> PSP. I'm sure it means something different in the other world, but we'll t we'll talk about peace sweat food. This, you know, so is there a specific uh, natural levels for each person based on their either genetic code or their chemistries or you know their health level? Is is there a way to know you know what's normal for me in in a natural detox? I, I just have to say one thing back to where do I start, uh -huh. especially if somebody's trying to improve their health. I always say you need some baseline. You need to know what status is your body in. And you know, one of the nice things that Step One Health has done is kind of made that easy for the average person to go and just get a basic wellness panel done that tells you whether your electrolytes are out of whack, whether your liver enzymes are out of whack, and that's where I would start. Make sure your body's functioning well because the last thing you want to do is start stimulating a liver that's already taxed. Mm -hmm. But once, if you get those back and you see that, yep, your lipids are up or your glucose is up, the first next step is try and eliminate all the insults. So step one mm -hmm. is know your baseline. Step two, in my mind, is remove as many of the insults as you can. And those insults, some of the biggies that were all, me included, and trust me, me and the family deal with this all the time, is your sugars, your alcohol consumption, your smoking, your coffee consumption, all these wonderful things, fat, you know, your trans fats. I mean, everybody has a French fry now and then. And the way to think of it is the more of those things that are taxing your body, that's just more hoarding on your counter. Mm -hmm. And it's harder for you to get to the good stuff. So once you've eliminated or tried to lessen some of that burden, now look at how you can facilitate it in your body. And again, your body has a very wonderful way of doing this. Eat, sweat, and poo. We do that naturally. And trust me, as you get older, you think a lot more about it. So. Um, mm -hmm. The, on the let's start with the pee side, right? So urinating is a normal way for the body to eliminate toxins, and we all do it. And it's funny when I talk to family and friends, and I ask them, "What do you think is normal for the number of times you go to the bathroom a day?" And being a former nurse, I can remember there were days at work where you didn't have time to go to the bathroom. Right. Yeah. And so if I went twice a day. I was thinking, well, you know, I just have this big camel's bladder and I must <laughs> just get rid of everything all, you know, twice a day. Little did I know that that's not good <laughs> at the time. And so the more you can facilitate natural, by natural I mean consuming good fluids and the best being clean, filtered water yeah. and help to dilute your body's fluid and you have your electrolytes that are in place, the kidneys will do a great job unless you have some type of a condition where your kidney is faulty um, or a you know advanced disease. Um, and so when I when I look at urinating, to me that's an easy one. It's natural. We don't think about it, but you gotta give it help with the right fluid and the right volume of fluid and electrolytes. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, you you bring up a great point, Tamara. Because as you've heard a million times, water, 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 and it just exactly. And it's one of those things that um, you know, I, I I know I'd volunteered to you that when I um, talk to patients about it, you know, there's a, a misperception about being hydrated that you can actually affect it by drinking water immediately. And I think people fail to recognize that when they drink their fluids, you know, it kind of has to go into the tummy and then get absorbed and then make its way into the bloodstream. And then finally, after many, many, you know, uh, passes and trips, it makes its way to its destination, which is the cell. And so that cell, I mean, it requires an abundance of water. And I would say that, you know, it, obviously it's one of the, the most important 
uh, compound out there. And as far as how many times you're going to pee, I would kind of say, well, that ought to go along with how much you're drinking. And so I find, you know, on the days that I'm doing a good job and we've got 8 to 10 to 12, you know, 8 ounce glasses of water a day, my urination pattern is going to reflect that. And I think if people were honest about it, they said, well, gosh, am I not going enough? Well, that's going to be by virtue of how much you're consuming. And so um, you almost can't overdo it with water. And when I say almost, you, you can, yeah. but uh, you know, it's pretty tough to do. And so um, if most people that are diligent about their water consumption, that would be the first really key step in not only detoxification, but also a healthy and cleaner diet. I mean, that's one of those nutritional, you know, sustaining, you know, compounds that we have to have, and very um, infrequently do we drink enough and, and get enough of it. So I have to tell you a family story. So my husband started developing hypertension, and he's notorious about not consuming a lot of fluid. So I thought, okay, I know he's low in electrolytes. I just know this based on diet and his sweating and some of the things that he does. So I started adding coconut water to his water. For whatever reason, he liked, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of taste, but he's at least getting the electrolytes. And while I may only get him to drink 32 to maybe 40 ounces a day, it has totally changed not only how much he's going to the bathroom. And it was interesting. After the first bottle, he said, wow. He says, I'm having to go to the bathroom all the time. And I said, well, what does that mean? Yeah. He says, well, you know, <laughs> normally I could drive for four hours and not have to stop. And now it's like every three hours or so I have to go to the bathroom. So when yes. people say, what is normal, I would sit, the way to think of it is, well, it's kind of like how often you change your oil. You know, there's your body has a certain mechanism that it needs to uh, transition fluids. And I would say every three to four hours minus sleep period, you should be urinating a decent amount of volume. And the kidneys will produce up to two quarts of urine a day if it's hydrated and functioning well. So that's a good way to give yourself a gauge and recognize if your electrolytes are off, you may be storing some of that fluid in your cells. It's not actually getting filtered out. So uh, to your point, of you can never take too much water. You can actually take too much and dilute electrolytes, and then you start retaining fluid. But um, if you have good electrolyte consumption, meaning a nice balance, you it's a great filter to get stuff out of your body. That's great. OK, so let's, well, now that we're on the PSP, let's talk about sweat. Uh, for a minute before we go on to, to uh, the other piece. but So there are people who, who just sweat naturally. They can go walk or work in the garden and work up a nice sweat. And, and, and there are other people who I hear uh, who, you know, it takes a lot for them uh, to, you know, start sweating and, you know, get to sweat no matter how much. What we typically think is, you know, you go exercise and you sweat. And, and, and some people just don't get that reaction. Um, so how, what is the natural uh, amount of sweat that somebody should be uh, releasing? And then, you know, what are some of the ways to kind of, in, you know, in, induce that if, if we're not doing it right? And I know you're going to say drink more water. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's interesting. Well, and Greg, I don't know if you want to take a shot at it, but I'll, I'll just tell you from a personal experience. Um, my genetic makeup, for whatever reason, even in high school when I played basketball, my coach would pull me off because my face would get so red and I just yeah. couldn't sweat. I just was not like everybody else and it never dripped off. I mean, this was in the South. Huh. So yeah. I just always thought I was lucky because, and guess what? I didn't have to wear deodorant because I guess what? I never sweated. Yeah. But did I know that I had something going on that wasn't helping me do that? And it's interesting about so oh, maybe about a year ago when I started facilitating sweating. And you can do this either mechanically with heat, literally, you know, and the body has two different uh, sweat glands. One is for cooling or maintaining the temperature of the body, and the other is for, I would say, scent. And it's the one that oftentimes it's the, the larger glands that you have underneath your armpits or in your groin area or on your palm of your hands and it typically is activated by stress and I always describe it as it's your pheromones. It's the one that smells. 
it's the one that has the protein and the bacteria in it, and this is what causes the smell as it starts to grow. So when you're around somebody that has a strong scent, it's this form of sweat gland that's secreting. And so stress can increase your sweat, temperature can mm -hmm. increase your sweat, and there's actually some certain herbs that will increase your sweat. Eating ginger or soaking a body in ginger will actually increase the production of sweat. And by soaking, I mean if you do Epsom salt bath, if you put a tablespoon of um, ginger, ground ginger, or if you have fresh ginger and you just squeeze it like you would garlic, notice the next time you take that Epsom salt bath how much more you sweat. Wow. And it's something that simple that can help facilitate your body's natural mechanism to kind of get rid of things. Oh, very cool. No, I never knew that. That's, uh, that's a pretty interesting uh, addition to the to the Epsom salts. Yeah, which is another way, of easy, a great way to, a very inexpensive way to detox. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm all charged up now on, uh, well, this, this, this comes with a price, but uh, I'm all charged up over the infrared uh, saunas. Yeah, yeah. I did that, you know, I did that um, when I hurt my back if, uh, about a year or so ago and couldn't exercise. One of the things that I would do was go, you know, I'd get on one of those um, vibration panel things that I didn't have to do a lot of movement, and then I'd spend about 20 minutes in one of those infrared uh, sweat things, which, you know, I, I, I thought it was great. I felt better. I felt energized after yeah. getting in that thing. I, you know, I, I can't say that I maintained any any weight loss, but I felt better just getting s stuff out. And yeah. It's one of the only ways I could sweat, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell me about the sauna. So I, I know there's a lot of information out there, and de depending on the research and who did the research, you know, there's pros and cons, and I actually – or this is how I approach things. I try and sift through the research to see is there bias to it or whatever. And some would say you don't really release a lot of toxins. Now, interestingly enough, there's more and more research coming out saying you actually can secrete uh, heavy metals. And when they start testing the actual sweat contents, they're noticing that things are coming out. So what is your take on that? Well, that's, you know, I, I was just looking at just such a article, and actually I watched an interview recently, and I think it was Dr. Clements with Dr. Mercola, and Dr. Clement, who runs the wellness center in, oh gosh, it's in Florida, it's South Florida somewhere, um, but um, he definitely was a proponent and talked about some of the research behind it. And I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but the heavy metals being able to, uh, you know, being able to secrete through one of these infrared saunas, and you know how how tr how important the correct infrared heating element is to to essentially heat from the inside out. And trust me, I don't totally get it yet because I haven't looked at thinking about how to cook a body, a human body, from the inside out. I get it in a microwave with my food, but I, you know, so I'm going to need to kind of. Um, vet this one out a little bit, but oftentimes, you know, some of the providers, some of the practitioners that I, I put a lot of trust in, I'll sort of follow some of their recommendations. I know Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Ben Lynch, um, I, I'm trying to remember which manufacturer, but I think he is a proponent of um, infrared sauna uh, therapy as well. And on, quite honestly, when I look at all of the different therapies, including, you know, um, well, let's let's just say all of the different modalities that you can use to detox. I think I'm pretty interested in all of them. It just kind of comes down to well, which ones can I take on, fit into my day, fit into my budget, and you know, there's a, again, like I said, a lot of moving parts, which is why it's so important for us to keep talking about it and say, okay, well, you know, your Tamara, we were able to take some of the natural detox mechanisms and start there, you know, prior to going to the facilitated detoxes and essentially just try and get our thumb on each one of these points. So to answer a long, uh, my long answer to the question on the infrared sauna, I, I have some confidence in it, but, you know, I'm still trying to figure it out and get to the bottom of it. Here's one thing to remember on the sweat side or that I like to remind people is it's really good at facilitating things coming out of the body, but your skin is the largest organ on your in your body. 
So when you allow the sweat to stay on the skin, you can actually start to reabsorb the same stuff that you're trying to get rid of. So one of the keys with sweating, and if anybody's ever worn one of those waistbands that helps shrink your fat in your stomach, and or you know not even changed after a good sweat, you'll notice rashes, or you'll notice you know your skin texture changing. So the key to, to facilitating detoxing with sweating is you never want your body to cool and or let the sweat stay on you. So as long as the sweat is still, you still feel yourself sweating, it's fine. But as soon as you start to cool off, make sure you're rinsing off or at least wiping off and changing your clothes so that you minimize the reabsorption. And so Great. that's something I emphasize about sweating. Great point. And, and just on the subject of sweat, since we're talking about water as well, um, in, in maintenance of water, we, no discussion would be complete without talking about the implications of alcohol or caffeinated products as well. So, you know, whenever we talk about hydration status, um, anyone out there should be mindful of alcohol and its diuretic effect. And so, essentially, when we get a diuretic that's um, from either alcohol or caffeine com containing product, uh, we lower the volume status of our body, pee out a little bit more of our moisture, and that makes our just the sum of our metabolic processes that much more difficult. So um, keep in mind the water status has to do with keeping holding on to water as opposed to eliminating it as well, in, in, in the right ways versus the wrong ways. In other words, peeing it out, uh, you know, appropriately is okay, but uh, peeing it inappropriately for just trying to, you know, get rid of all of the uh, volume of your body is a little bit problematic. Fantastic. Okay, let's talk about it. We've been talking about it as a group for a long time. Let's talk about poop. <laughs> the final P. Final <laughs> <laughs> poop, people. <laughs> I think this is, you know, this is one of those things that. Um, you know, in our in our regular meetings and our you know pre hangout, we talk a lot about uh, the, the natural detox and and I do think it you you are concerned more about pee and poop as you get older, and so keep on living, young people. You'll you'll get to where we are. But so talk about the you know you know the natural uh, how the body handles uh, detoxification through poop and you know what's you know, how do we know what's normal and, you know, how do we know what works for our own bodies? Great. You, you, you like this one, Tamara? I, I, you know, I... Well, I'm smiling only because, you know, part of my stents in nursing was at a nursing home. And my routine every morning with pretty much every one of my patients was, Okay, so how's our routine going this morning? Yeah. And we can have a 30-minute discussion about, well, I haven't shed in three days. <laughs> the, so you do get obsessed, and we all probably had that situation when we go on vacation or something, we get irregular, and we just don't feel right. Well, the reason why is that's one of your biggest modes of detoxification, and it's literally taking out the garbage bags that made the cake. And so if it's not coming out, guess what? It's storing somewhere. And so the your natural body's way of uh, eliminating literally the toxins through your stool is helped with fiber. Every, I, everybody's heard this one, right? The fiber, mm -hmm. the moisture, the water. I, I'm a big advocate for eat your vitamins anytime you can because typically what comes with them if you can digest them, are the, the cellular, you know, literally the fiber and the stuff your body doesn't digest, which helps in that elimination process. Mm -hmm. But in those times that you can't or that you're finding you're backed up, and I was one of those, like for many years, I thought going once a week was normal mm -hmm. or going twice a week was normal. And it wasn't until literally I went into nursing school and, and when I would read these things about going twice a day was normal I'm thinking right who goes twice a day nobody goes <laughs> twice a day well lo and behold that is probably more of the norm than not and it's just a high processed diet one without a lot of fiber or moisture guess what you're not going to go and then add to it your whole bioflorum 
and, you know, what lives in your gut affects it as well, and that's probably for another hangout. But um, just basically, the more you go, the more you're actually eliminating. And I, I would say this, and then I'll let Greg chime in here, but both with, with the, the peeing and the pooing, there are herbs and supplements you can take that facilitate both of these. But what you're not trying to do is frequency. I mean, unless you're going for a colonoscopy or you're going for something where you need to literally wipe yourself clean intestinally, you really want to facilitate the, the normal process. And so at times you may need stimulants or external help to do the normal process, but you'll know you're in good health when that works. And I say that because guess what? When I come home from a vacation, the first thing I ask the person keeping care of our cats is, have they been eating and have they been pooing? And if they're eating, pooing, and peeing, I know they're healthy <laughs> as best I can with a cat. Well, humans are pretty much that way too, including our children. Um, and so when we start to think about how do you facilitate you know, the bowel aspect, I would say here's where a lot of caution needs to come into play, and Greg, I'll, I'll let you talk about it as well. That all being said, there's some very simple things one can do to help facilitate. Yeah, I, I think you're right, and I think the, you know, getting into specific agents that may help things along, you know, maybe we want to consider that for a, a later discussion, but what I would say is this. When we take a look at pee, sweat, and poo, I mean, who I would cut in the same category for obvious reasons. I'll go back to that in just a second. The, the sweat is one of those things that we can facilitate, right? We can, you know, I mean, it happens by virtue of the fact of our, like you said, our stress and what goes on in our day to day, but we can also work out yoga and, uh, you know, ride elliptical bikes and, and move some sweat that way. P, as we talked about, is going to be a natural consequence of you know our volume and how much we're drinking, and and I kind of look at you know looking at um, the poo side of it in that same way, and so my uh, you know my go-to on a natural detox is always to start with a whole foods diet because I. I I can see very, very little downside to that. And whenever I talk about the Whole Foods, you've heard me say this before, Cheryl, many, many times. But you know, just looking at you know the the protein coming from lean, uh, you know, lean grass-fed beef, wild-caught seafood, organic pulp, and then organic vegetables, and of course, sustaining nuts and seeds and health fats. And with the right mix, and we're doing you know with plenty of water, the right mix of those, my my belief is that the, the pooing aspect of that sort of happens naturally with the right frequencies. Now, uh, again, I know there are people with you know, metabolic disorders and genetic um, compromises that may make that more difficult. And again, that's where we get to that starting point. What's the status? Where do we start? How do we get you to this next point to where this, you know, the natural aspects of detox happen, you know, uh, by virtue of just, you know, part of the natural process. Um, and so that's why I always look at the, you know, the first step in, in um, detoxing is looking at our environment and the, the easiest go-to is our food. It's the one that we, you know, consciously put hand to mouth and, and we have those choices. And so, you know, getting to that whole food diets, I think, will play a big, a big part in, um, in, in the, the bulk formation and uh, the frequency of stool and all of that. I think that, you know, plays, you know, one of the hugest part in it, and then getting into the things that will allow that facilitation through, you know, herbs and and uh, other methods. I haven't really got too deep into that. I don't know if you've done much of that as well, Tamara. Well, here's a simple way that I coach people to look at it: is after you you've consumed something, if there's packaging or something left, the chances are it's processed and it's not a whole food. And, and that goes as far as even whether you eat an apple with a skin versus a banana that has a peel. You know, sway towards the apple because with it comes its own kind of mechanism to help the body eliminate, you know, the leftovers after you've digested. This is the fiber, et cetera. Um, it's interesting because when I first started this whole journey of health and a lot of what I did was to talk family and friends kind of off the ledge. You know, what's nice and what's good and what's bad about the information age is that people have access to a whole lot of information. And 
oftentimes they'll find this quick you know weight loss or this will correct all your problems if you do this and um, I'm sure everybody's heard of caffeine enemas or different enemas to help facilitate um, detoxing and part of what you have to have people do sometimes is just step back and say if you don't understand how it's working then you probably shouldn't do it on your body and I'm not asking everybody to be a biochemist but you want to know enough to know when the good could be harmful and that's where having a good health coach or somebody that understands maybe at a higher level to talk to is important this is why you shouldn't do these things on your own if you don't understand it you're really gambling um, and let's use caffeine enemas because it seems like that one's all over the internet if you googled it right now you'd probably come up with as many hits as you would the space station right. and um, probably the, the at least through my lens of learning so far the, the father of all caffeine enemas is Garrison who actually has a therapy treatment for cancer using caffeine enemas and for anybody who even understands what an enema is it's where you're putting substance or fluid into the lower bowel or the colon to help stimulate both expansion which is the limit which causes a response to eliminate and or to flush out the lining so like for a colonoscopy you can see any woman who's ever had a baby probably has had their experience of the enema so that you're cleaning out your colon before the baby's delivered and you're not being delivered at the same time you're going to the bathroom or pooping as you're delivering and so when what I've seen out there in regards to the research on the caffeine enema is pretty interesting because you know, and oh, by the way, yes, it was in the Merck Manual of uh, Health up till most recently as a method of eliminating. And we're talking small volume of fluid that you prepare as uh, safely as you can. And um, most would say use stainless steel or uh, products and or if you have glass, that's great but the container that you put the solution in should be one that doesn't have toxins. So this is a good example of understand what you're doing, right? Um, some people would say you can just brew a pot of coffee and use that coffee. Others would say no, you need to take organic beans, grind them fresh, and through my lens I would say that makes more sense because you have more less rancid bean, you have or rancid oils, and oils are fresher and being released uh, you know most immediately you bring it to a boil and then you strain it out and the thing I encourage people to do is if you're straining it out in a bleached strainer or a bleached coffee filter to me that's a little bit of a okay so I'm trying to get toxins out but now am I getting any of that chlorine and the solution that I'm now introducing into my body so right. if you just come at it from a purist sense they would say you boil anywhere from you know four two to four tablespoons of freshly ground organic coffee <clears throat> and and we're talking a medium roast or something that would have a moderate amount of caffeine uh, the caffeine actually has or the the coffee bean actually has two chemicals in it palmitic acid and cafasol and both of those are gallbladder stimulating um, and with the, it, one, one is gallbladder stimulating and the other actually helps to, or some research has found it will stimulate the production of what I call the trash bags or glucathione. And so when we talked about all that trash and having the trash bags, that's one of the rationale behind the caffeine enemas. And so you're taking a small amount of pre-prepared uh, caffeine solution, straining out the rounds, uh, using a, the appropriate, and you can find all of this on Garrison, and I encourage you if you're thinking about this to do some research, but Garrison.org is probably the best, one of the best reference sites that explains the science behind it and how they do it. Um, and I would say some things to be cautious of. You know, uh, obviously you're boiling coffee, so do I need to say any more? You want to make sure that it's at room temperature before you ever start to facilitate, because you could obviously do a lot more harm than good. But what you're doing, or what you want to think about, is 
you're trying to expand the lower colon where the body doesn't absorb nutrients anymore. It's kind of the storage site for all the trash bags, you know, all your poop. And what stimulates your body to release that is usually expansion of the colon. So literally by doing the enema, you're stretching the tissue that stimulates the urge to go. This is why oftentimes it's so hard to hold an enema, especially if you have too much volume. Now what's interesting about the caffeine enema is you're really you're using a small amount of volume and if you're having trouble with holding it, back off on your volume and intensity. And that can usually help. But the other mechanism that's happening is you're actually absorbing these two acids that I mentioned, the malic and the capricol, if I'm pronouncing that, capistol, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And what those do is actually stimulate the gallbladder. And it's interesting, when I, again, was trying to explain this process to one of the family members and I'm looking online at some of the research, there was a whole debate over which side do you lay on? Mm -hmm. or do you lay on your back or whatever? And in my simplistic, you know, anatomy thinking, I'm saying to myself, well, I know if you lay on your right side, you're going to keep the contents pretty much within the colon, which that is what you're trying to do. But let's say, and I will say having tried this, because I never recommend or try and coach people that if I'm not willing to try it myself, I had a lot more effect lying on my back after um, letting the amount of caffeine solution enter the colon, I roll on my back. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I found, I think about just the physiology is how the gallbladder is positioned in the liver. And if you're trying to facilitate the release of your gallbladder, you want the neck of the gallbladder to be as open as possible. Now, everybody's body's different, so maybe different positions will help. I know when I was listening to my the sounds, you know, the bowel sounds, which God knows I've been listening to for years, I could actually hear a very high pitch squeak, and, and I call it the, the gallbladder release especially after I've taken in a very deep breath and then relaxed. And so if you're considering doing this kind of therapy, something also to consider is you need to be in a relaxed state. You can't be sitting there doing text on your cell phone and expect your body to go through its natural state. But take, taking deep breaths, letting your body do its thing, and what the caffeine enemas are trying to facilitate is the release of gallbladder juices. And the way to think about your liver is it's your little, it's your little dialysis machine. It's in there just like your kidneys. It's filtering your blood every three minutes. And the bile salts and some of those other toxins that are stored in your gallbladder can then be released back into your intestines. Now, that should make everybody say, okay, well, if you're releasing those back into my intestines, isn't that where the food, get, the nutrients gets absorbed? And all of a the, the biggest mistake, at least through my, my experience with my family, is they were doing this, but they weren't doing anything to absorb the stuff that was getting released. And so if you're considering doing this kind of process, make sure you have enough absorbable fiber in your intestines to catch all that stuff that you're trying to get rid of. And the best ones usually are apple pectin. Some people use yucca root. Some people will use activated charcoal or the hit, what I call the heavy hitters, certain type of um, activated clays. The caution with that, for anybody that's ever used it, if you use too much, you're just going to bind yourself up. And also, because it is so absorbing, you could be absorbing some of the nutrients that your body needs. So it's more of an art than a science right now, I think, or I'm sure Garrison would disagree with that because he's had some great success, and he's doing it as a therapy. But if people are doing it to cleanse or to detox, the things you want to consider is the volume, you know, the absorbing the toxins after you've done it, and the procedure, and to think through and make sure you're not introducing something harmful while you're trying to get harmful things out. Sorry, feel free to chime in. No, that, that was a great way of, uh, of putting it. And, and um, you know, 
it's, it's one of those things that when I think about the, so I haven't done one of these coffee enemas yet, though I've been reading quite a bit about it, and Gerson using it from a from a disease mitigation standpoint to really kind of clamp down on cancers and metastatic disease, you know, I would say that all of the things that we do from a detox standpoint really kind of provide that same thing. And so when we look at natural um, natural resolution of cancers that people for which people have been successful, it really comes down to you know the sustenance of the you know the wonderful nutrition that can you know help the natural killer cells shut down the cancer and provide the sustenance to you know let the healthy cells grow and so that same theory you know just within a sick person or even you know those of us that are you know relatively healthy let's say um, the the therapies are going to be you know the same and we're going to feel the same wonderful effects from those therapies despite it being you know for a heavy duty you know cancer prevention versus hey we just want to be able to detox and feel better and then get on the right sort of the right frame so we can start a new diet and uh, you know have these lifestyle changes that are long lasting and, and really work well. Awesome. That, that was great. Great explanation, Tamara. I think I think we, really great explanation. Uh, <laughs> we were all quiet because you know, we were listening to you yeah. <laughs> getting our own getting getting our own information. So we <laughs> talked a little bit earlier about, you know, where would where should one start before they start any kind of detox program? And I think we touched on uh, a little bit last week when we were talking about sugar and you know, you know detoxing the body from sugar. We've talked to PSP today, but where should one start uh, or begin if they're thinking about starting a detox program? Well, I was just going to say I emphasized earlier, and you know I say this to family and friends all the time, and this is my take on it: is if you don't know where you're at don't start changing right so in my view you need some type of even if it's just your simplistic and I call it and it's because I'm familiar with the step one um, lab what they describe it as the wellness panel mm -hmm. it pretty much just gives you a snapshot of how's my body doing with my genetics and with my environment how am I doing just based on standard traditional medicine measures and then you go from there. And the other thing I coach people on is if you're on medications, you need to take an extra step of precaution. And what's so interesting for me is I have better success with all of the coaching and the therapies. And you know, I mentioned uh, my husband's blood pressure and the something as simple as the coconut water increasing his urine flow. Well, he's not on any medication. And yet his brother, who happens to be on several, uh, didn't have the same effect. So just that introducing medications can change your whole chemistry and how that chemistry works. So um, know your baseline measures. Make sure you're getting some type of baseline lab. And if you're not doing that once a year, I would say you should be doing it twice a year and would question if it's affordable, try it four times a year. Because that's your measuring stick. Mm -hmm how things are working. And if that's not feasible, at a minimum it should be once a year. Nobody should be driving their, their machine blind. But I would say that's where you start. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, you know, we, we had talked um, in our previous discussions how uh, I, I like to believe that I've kind of put the pieces in play to, you know, run a very premium healthy lifestyle. And of course, um, to Tamara's uh, point, once we got what we call my status, which is the ba baseline, um, there were definitely some markers that I just would not know, uh, would have not have known about had I not gotten that status. And there were important markers as well, very um, suggestive inflammatory markers that would say, gosh, despite how you feel and what you're doing, there are some things that are um, problematic in the future and that can be uh, you know, an issue for my cardiovascular health, and so it was important to have that baseline. And now it's kind of time to, you know, let that rubber hit the road and say, well, let's cover the aspects from a, you know, physical exercise standpoint, from nutrition, detoxification, uh, mitigating those risks within my home. You know, making sure that I've got the right water filters and dechlorinators, and you know, all of those things together are the only way that we can. Um, you know, make well. I shouldn't say the only way we make a difference. We can start making differences in all these areas, but until we address them all, you know, we, it's tough to perfect the the uh, 
the, the scene, let's say. Well, that's great. I'm going to actually uh, include, since you guys have brought up a couple times, I'm going to include the link to that basic panel from Step One Health that people can get started with. Um, and, you know, I agree that you should do it once, twice, <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, one, of the, one of the great sessions we had uh, at uh, the Digital Health Panel in Las Vegas was a panel called uh, Data Overload, where people <laughs> knew too much, but I seriously don't think you can know too much about your own, your own machine, your own body. So I think that's an awesome uh, analogy there. You, know, you don't want to drive the machine blind. That's my favorite take out of that. Yep, so sure. uh, believe it or not, we're at our one hour mark. <laughs> it seems like time flies when we're having fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, Very good. Well, it's, it was a great talk. Thanks, um, Cheryl, as always, for having great questions and, you know, giving us the sort of the topics to discuss here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tamara. I hope you will join us again. This was fun. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you'll join us again and, and we'll talk more about uh, the gut and detox and, and any topics that uh, people have questions. If you have questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A or over on LiveFAQ.com and we'll hopefully get Tamara back. Yep, and Absolutely. just remember PSP. 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 Nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks everybody. Have awesome. a great Thanks, day. Guys. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. So I'm going to...